Okay, we'll start in a minute. So uh, please help yourselves to the uh, food and the drinks and so on, and then uh, we'll begin. Okay, let's begin. Oh, just just now, just with us having a conversation with um, Tim about how when we often when when democracy is talked about, discussed, uh, nobody uh, fantasizes that you know we live in kind of nirvana democracy. But the tendency is tend to see the democratic project as an incomplete project uh, that if there was greater effort, there was greater will, uh, greater intelligence devoted to this project, then we come closer to this uh, uh, point uh, of perfection. And I think what's really exciting about Tim's work, and the many things that are exciting about Tim's work, is that how he brings to the fore how the democratic project is not just an incomplete project, but it's really quite a flawed project, that uh, in part, uh, because of uh, certain inherent contradictions within the project and how the risks uh, of elite control and a lot of things have always been focused on the risk as well as the reality of plutocracy is something that actually accompanies uh, the democratic project and not something that stands outside the democratic project. So I think very exciting to uh, introduce um, my friend Tim, uh, Tim Kuna, who's um, uh, an associate professor at uh, Auckland Law School, and really a um, uh, person that's quite well established in taking a very critical approach in terms of the law of democracy. Um, it's written this wonderful book, and um, I, I feel a bit remiss I didn't bring a copy of it, actually, uh, and I would highly recommend it, Capitalism versus Democracy, which is really this fantastic uh, analysis, systemic analysis of the role of money and politics in the American political system. Uh, what Tim is going to talk about today is not that book, but another book, uh, book that he has co-edited, which got, has this fantastic cover, um, Democracy by the People, which he co-edited with uh, Eugene Mazo. And you're going to speak to one of the, the first chapter of that particular book, The Third Coming of American Plutocracy. He's going to do that about 40 minutes. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, and then um, I'll look forward to um, a robust and wonderful discussion. Thanks, Richard. Sure. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Is, is the volume okay? Should I speak up? That's good enough? Okay, terrific. Well, thanks for coming. I'm excited to share this book chapter with you from the volume that Zhu Chang just uh, held up, which is a volume dedicated to the idea that some reforms are still feasible in the United States despite the Supreme Court's handiwork. Um, and we'll talk a bit about the Supreme Court's handiwork today, but there's a, a, from the perspective of reform, there's a fairly frustrating line of decisions, starting with Buckley v. Vallejo in 1976, that has led a lot of people and lawmakers to feel fairly um, paralyzed in the face of constitutional jurisprudence tying their hands. And Eugene Mazo and I had the idea to um, ask experts in the field and in the academy to write what they thought would be the best plausible, viable, immediately implementable sorts of reforms and to put that into one volume. But it also has some food for thought in there. It's not just a practical piece. It discusses what we can learn from foreign democracies as well. And uh, my chapter in particular <clears throat> is really not practical in the immediate sense. What it is is an attempt to find, I think, um, the proper historical frame or the proper historical motivation for campaign finance reform. And that's what I want to talk about uh, a bit with you all today. So um, I've made this chapter available for you. It's just going to be temporary because I'm fairly convinced I'm violating copyright by doing this. But um, actually, it, all of you with the university ID, I'm sure, can just grab it. But any, if you want to go to timcuner.com, the events tab has the chapter available now. Um, OK, so the inspiration for my chapter was this quote from Alexis de Tocqueville from Democracy in America. and. Um, Let's see. 
what had me thinking about this quote was the notion that uh, the present obviously is, is always much more obscure to us than the past, right? When you're looking back at history, like in this chapter, um, I look at slavery and the Gilded Age, and when you're looking back, it's crystal clear. The value judgments, um, your historical understanding, the data, but especially the, the cultural understanding, right? Where society has evolved to a certain point where you can see past eras as unjust and be entirely confident in your assessment as such. And so, however, uh, when you're in the present moment and you're trying to evaluate the present moment, I think there's this haze, right, that is conveyed by this picture, what I call the historical haze, right, that you're, you're sort of in the midst of time and maybe in 30 or 40 or 50 years it'll be entirely clear how to evaluate your moment in history back then. But for some reason in the present, it never seems to be adequately clear. Um, now, uh, so I was sure, however, that these, this historical haze, these mists of time, I was convinced that they had lifted in 2014. So there's uh, this sort of bombshell period, this explosion between April 2nd and April 15th in 2014 that I bet um, most of you know, you might know all three of these bombs that, that sort of exploded simultaneously in this two-week period, um, but I'm sure you at least know one of them. Um, so to, just to start on the left, Thomas Piketty's study came out, at least the English version, in 2014. And what he exposed um, from the US standpoint was that the United States had become the most economically unequal of all the advanced democracies. The most economically unequal of all the advanced democracies. And what he had cataloged was this 40-year period between 1970 and 2010, which brought the United States, after so much rising inequality, to a point at which the top 10% owned over 70% of national wealth. So that's a really substantial portion, which we'll see in a second why I say that. But historically speaking, that's a very substantial number that the top 10% of the population would hold 70, well, actually 72% of total wealth, whereas the bottom 50% only owned 2% of national wealth. So the bottom half of the whole country owned only 2% of national wealth. And Piketty takes pains to say that capitalism doesn't inevitably produce outcomes like this, that this is special, that there's something special about this 40-year period, not just in the United States, but globally, he found, uh, of this of rising inequality in this kind of extreme way. And he says that you need law and policy. You, the capitalism doesn't just automatically sort people into winners and losers in such a stark way but rather this is a social, political construction of the economic system, um, the political economy, if you like, that would lead to such an extreme outcome. Now, that was, I thought that was a fairly big deal, but really, um, just a week from Piketty's study, there's this, um, this other study called Testing Theories of American Politics by Martin Gillins and Benjamin Page, who, um, they're not economists, they're political scientists, and they looked at uh, about 2,000 issue areas at the federal level in the United States and they tried to match the outcomes of law and policy with the policy preferences of those who had been weighing in and who had opinions on those areas of law and policy. And what they found, um, just to, to give a quote here, is that economic elites and organized groups representing business interests have substantial independent impacts on US government policy, while mass-based interest groups and average citizens have little or no independent influence. And that's extremely stark, right? That's, that's quite a statement that, that average citizens and mass-based interest groups representing consumers, the environment, product safety, whatever it might be, have little or no independent influence. And in some of their other work, they talk about how this really means that the United States is a plutocracy, and these are people who think very empirically. So they're not making this claim in a ideologically charged kind of way. They're saying, wow, you know, if you really look at these outcomes, there's really no other way to think about this than government of, by, and for the wealthy. Um, now, how do they explain that lack of influence uh, for average citizens and mass-based interest groups? They cite that the, the fact that it's well established that organized groups lobby and fraternize with public officials, move through revolving doors between public and private employment, provide self-serving information to officials, draft legislation, and spend a great deal of money on election campaigns. Now, um, I mean, most of us really didn't need Gillens and Page to tell us that, that those factors were operational. It was just the empirical outcome that they documented that was so surprising, the, the strength of it empirically. 
Um, just intuitively, the, the explanation they gave had been well known for a very, very long time. I mean, this, this sort of lobbying imbalance over a 10-year period uh, where business interests controlled 95% of the top 100 lobbying organizations is, was very well known. And you can look at the spending from different industries and you can even track uh, essentially how much of a return they're getting. Uh, I've seen a study that suggests, um, it's in the chapter, that there's a 500 to 600% return on investment through this sort of massive outlay of lobbying expenditures. So I think that was fairly well known, I think. Um, oh, I didn't even realize this was in here. Uh, Trump's and Clinton's financing. Uh, he's so well prepared, he doesn't know his own slides. This was also indicative of, of trends that had been increasing for a long time. The super PAC funding, the campaign funding going over a billion dollars per candidate. Uh, was something that, that wasn't new either. Um, and if you looked at not just the presidency at an average of about a billion dollars, but the Senate and the House in the millions, this was a trend that was a long time uh, in the making. But it's interesting because it coincides with what Piketty and Gillins and Page are all documenting. Um, and uh, we, the other thing that became clear empirically, if you look back, is that the money that, that they're talking about, Gillens and Page, when they say uh, that the wealthy are fraternizing and funding campaigns, what's clear is that the money is coming from a really small percentage of the general public. So if you look at the top number, 0.6%, that's a figure from um, campaign financing. It's an average I took from the, the early 1990s to, um, I think it was around 2012, where if you just average out where most of the money is coming from, it's coming from this percent or less of the adult population. So 0.6% is not exactly representative, but the spend, so that's the donor class. The spender class is even much, is even less representative of the overall population. Looking at the super PACs that were most well-funded in 2012, you could find about 200 donors supplying 75, 80% of the money. So those 200 people are obviously an infinitesimal um, percentage of the overall adult population. So um, all of this, again, um, and then the other thing about the donor class and the spender class, it's not just that they're a minuscule portion of the population. The other issue is that uh, they're highly unrepresentative in other ways, too. So besides just being a numerical elite, they're highly unrepresentative in terms of sex, education, income, race, as you sort of go through. So again, this really does help to explain uh, Gillens and Page's conclusion, right? If the people who are funding politics are not at all representative, well, what do they want? And that brings us actually to the most defining or best defining trait of the donor and spender class, which is research suggesting that ideologically they're much more conservative. Um, morally, it's kind of a mixed bag, but when it comes to distributive issues, Ideologically, they're much more conservative. So they want reduced spending on uh, subsidies for, um, not subsidies, sorry, entitlements. They want reduced spending on social welfare. They want uh, a tax code that's favorable to wealth. They want tort law reform, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that, that really lines up quite well. The other thing that I think tends to explain these outcomes that Piketty and Gillens and Page reach is the wealth of members of Congress themselves. Uh, clearly, if you're wondering why are people reaching political outcomes that are favorable to wealth, well, if the people making those decisions happen to have a good amount of money invested in the same places as their donor base, you know, there's self-interest to add. In addition to their self-interest in being re-elected, there's simply self-interest in terms of their own pocketbooks. So on average now, in the states, we have um, off the average office holder, even including the House, is worth more than a million dollars. Another sort of suspicious statistic was that during the 2008 to 2009 economic crisis, the wealth of average Americans went down, poor Americans, retirees went down even more. Members of Congress, their wealth increased fairly substantially during that period. Um, okay, so those were the first two wake-up calls, as I like to call them, from 2014. Again, sort of moving towards this idea of dispelling the historical haze and the mists surrounding our understanding of the present. I think the third event that really helped dispel that haze is the McCutcheon v. FEC case, which, um, if you haven't heard about it already, is a case striking down one of the last limits that was remaining from Watergate, uh, the main limits that were passed in response to Nixon's scandal in 1974. The one at issue in McCutcheon is the aggregate donation limit, which 
held each individual donor at $123,000 in change as a maximum. So the $123,000 limit was to the total, the, the, total num the total amount of money that you could donate to all campaigns and uh, political committees combined. There are individual donation limits, which is how the maximum you could give to any particular campaign candidate committee, and then there are aggregate limits that are all of that in total. So the Supreme Court strikes down this aggregate limit 5-4 um, case, you know, it's, it's another really close case like Citizens United, and um, it strikes it down, paving the way for $3.6 million donations now per person if you sort of add all the different campaigns and committees together and you max out individually on each, we could be back in the realm of these multi-million dollar donors that hadn't been seen since Watergate, actually. Now, I don't bring this case up so much because of that outcome, because the, the donor class is already infinitesimally small. It's not going to get a lot smaller, and even if it did, I don't think it would matter at this point. It's already so well established how small and unrepresentative the donor class is. The reason I bring up McCutcheon is, is actually a different reason, which is um, I found it really mostly in Piketty's own thinking where he says, look, you know, this level of inequality that I've discovered, um, it harkens back to feudalism. It harkens back to revolutionary periods in France and elsewhere where you get to a certain level of inequality and ordinary people just won't stand for it anymore. Unless, he said, and he said, he said, this is the most important thing, if there's an apparatus of justification. In other words, if that level of inequality and the system sustaining it can be ideologically justified in a credible way, people will bite their tongue or sh shield their, uh, what is it, put your sword in, in the scabbard or whatever the, the, the saying would be, that uh, if there's a credible ideological justification, then inequality can last much longer. And he says that this is even more important than the jails and the, the criminal law, which he calls the oppressive apparatus. So the, the key for Piketty and the, dur and the durability of this inequality is what he calls the ideological apparatus. And that's what's interesting about McCutcheon. So McCutcheon does a couple of things, and one of them is to define corruption very, very narrowly. Because corruption was part of the motivation for restricting aggregate donations. You don't want multi-million dollar donors if you're worried about corruption. But the court says it's not a form of corruption if an individual spends a lot, a lot of money, large sums of money, and garners influence over or access to elected officials or political parties. So influence or access to officials or political parties is not corruption, even if it's obtained through extremely large campaign donations. The quote goes on, uh, the court says, government regulation may not target the general gratitude a candidate may feel towards those who support him or her or his allies, or the political access that such support may afford. Ingratiation and access are not corruption. Uh, so for the court, the what corruption is, is limited to basically a quid pro quo sort of exchange. They, they say, quote, an exchange of an official act for money. So unless you can tie the donation to a specific action that the office holder took with the intent of um, providing a benefit for the inducement of that contribution, you really can't establish corruption anymore, according to the Supreme Court. But that's not all, right? They've redefined democratic responsiveness as ingratiation and access on the basis of wealth. And they say that as well in the opinion, that constituents support candidates who share their beliefs. Um, and candidates who are elected can be expected to be responsive to those concerns, including those of donors. Uh, that's representative democracy, in their view. So that, that's what really surprised me about McCutcheon. So that, that was what occurred in 2014 in terms of campaign finance and in terms of how you would conceive of campaign finance reform. And so you know, it seemed to me that this is plutocracy, period government of buying for the wealthy. You could see it in terms of the return on investment going into a type of capitalism that was really profitable for the rich and bad for most, of, most everyone else. And you could see it in political responsiveness itself in Gillens and Page. Um, but what is plutocracy, right? From a present day standpoint, what's our experience with it? Um, I don't know that we have a frame for that. You know, I don't know that people would say, oh, well, geez, it looks like we have government that's quite responsive to the wealthy, which reminds me of you know, it, it's that quote from, from de Tocqueville, you know, in the spirits walking in darkness. You don't really know what plutocracy means unless you're able to connect it up with moments in the past that I think are very well understood and internalized. 
Now, the tendency, I think, in the literature is just to connect up plutocracy with privatization and neoliberalism. And I think that's true, but I don't think that's the historically resonant way to look at it. So the, the privatization argument kind of would make it seem modern, right? So what have advanced democracies done with mass transportation, healthcare, product safety? Well, you know, there's still the social democracies kind of hanging on there by a thin thread. Uh, Australia is still an example of a place that still takes care of people to some extent, uh, the, the National Health Service in the UK. But the trend has been towards privatization in those four decades that PKD was tracking. And that's part of the reason for the rising inequality that he discusses. So, you know, you could look at campaign finance as just another front in which the private sphere, the market is growing, and the public sphere and state control is shrinking. Because basically what McCutcheon does, along with many other decisions in the same line, is to say this is not an area for the government to regulate. The market can sort this out, right? You're, you're censoring people, the price signals, that they're sending with their campaign donations and campaign spending. Um, those price signals are political participation and political association, and we want to keep those in the private sphere of each person's own freedom, not in the public sphere to be regulated. So it, it fits with this, um, and but there's something weird about it, right? So if you, if you think about privatization across the economic side on the left, you know, um, factories, natural resources, even the more controversial things, like the privatization of prisons and war through uh, mercenaries and Halliburton, etc., healthcare, you're still looking at something that could be called uh, economic production. You know, you're offering a good or a service that people desire, right? Um, but if you look on the right hand side, so on the left hand side, under that question mark, I would put the means of economic production, essentially, and with some very controversial things going into that design. Um, Margaret Jane Radin has a great book called Contested Commodities where she says these things don't belong in the economic side of the equation. These things belong in the government side of the equation. It's very dangerous to put them in with other things that can be privatized and privately owned, deregulated, etc., sold for a profit. But that, to my mind, over here is even less controversial than privatizing campaign and party finance, uh, petitioning and grievances. Right? privatizing the process of petitioning your representatives, privatizing the process of um, basically the, the production of political knowledge and the sphere of public debate, right? Um, this to me strikes me as not really part of the economic means of production, but rather the means of political production. So I would, I would really do a sharp line down the middle and say that the right side uh, have to, has to do with the means of political production. And privatization there um, would be to legalize corruption, in my view. But I still feel like this sounds kind of modern and doesn't give us a very good historical understanding of what it means. You know, because now you just sound like a socialist. Hey, I want to keep social democracy, or I want to keep this as the part of the public sphere, I want to abolish class government, etc., etc. Um, so uh, this is that frame that I'm talking about. And so this overlaps with the stuff that's been in vogue for a while now, right? Pluralist, democracy, public choice theory, that sort of stuff. And that's, I think, the conventional lens for looking at this. And the critique would be, hey, rent seeking is inefficient, right? That would be the critique. That, that not that you're not exercising rights of political speech and association, but that you're doing so in a way that undermines capitalism and competition on the merits, right? Uh, it's inefficient. Um, I don't think the inefficiency frame, the rent-seeking frame, is ever going to inspire the kind of political action that would be required to change the plutocratic outcomes that we saw in 2014. People are not going to take to the streets opposing rent-seeking. It's just not going to happen. Um, if, we, if, it, if we keep with this frame, it's just going to be the, the domain of specialists, right? So, I mean, the other way, the most obvious historical frame would be to look at Rome um, and analyses of the decline of Rome, which focus on the privatization of government. And uh, I thought that this quote was really interesting about how, uh, as Rome is getting stretched too thin and it's going from republic to empire and then it's weak and it's susceptible to invasions and obviously there's many factors but one of the analyses that I found from a Yale historian discusses this marketplace of power ruled by naked self-interest and the distortion of government. 
that's a powerful frame. But how many people are going to say, oh, Rome, you know, we don't want to be like Rome. I mean, is Rome really a powerful historical example that most people have a lot of opinions on? Uh, not at all. You know, people don't wake up thinking, how do I avoid Rome today? I don't want to end up like that. Uh, no. But the other place I thought to look for parallels in terms of this mode of government called plutocracy, the economic inequality it produces, and the political inequality it embodies, the other places I thought to look are much more recent. Um, one is uh, the slavery era, the, the antebellum South where um, this marketplace, to adopt our modern framework, extended to human beings right? and their descendants who could be bought, you know, they could be uh, bought, uh, sold, owned, um, their offspring would be owned and their labor was free, they could be disciplined however you want, they didn't have personhood, they couldn't own property, they couldn't legally contract for anything, they were property, right? Human beings as property, that's the extension of the market back then. Uh, and we know, you know, we have our judgments about how wrong that was. The other time that plutocracy hit the kind of state that, that we saw in 2014 is the Gilded Age and the Industrial Revolution, especially the earlier, well, the early, pretty much the whole way through, actually. I'll tell you the statistics I have. So uh, things that we know to be wrong today are child labor, unregulated workplace conditions, uh, work days that would, would go all day and all night. Um, so these, I think, these images historically are much more resonant than uh, inefficient marketplaces uh, for political outcomes. And strangely enough, de Tocqueville, who gave us that quote about the spirit walking in darkness in democracy in America as well, expressed concern about the direction that the country was heading when he was surveying these, um, basically, uh, sweatshops. He referenced the manufacturing aristocracy, which for Tocqueville, that was the relevant word, right? The aristocracy was what he had experience with historically in, in his moment of history. He said that the friends of democracy should keep their eyes anxiously fixed on the manufacturing aristocracy, for if ever a permanent inequality of conditions and aristocracy again penetrates into the world, it may be predicted that this is the gate by which they will enter. I thought that was interesting that the very person who's so concerned about that historical framework saw one of his own demons reflected in the direction that the United States was taking. Um, okay, so what do the data say? Uh, when you look at the antebellum era, there was a great deal of inequality, and if you could only factor in the slaves themselves into this equation, of course, the top 20% of the, the, the bottom 40% of the population would own even less, right? If you were able to factor in those many millions of people inequality would look higher. But even so, um, even in that sort of um, improperly calculated form, it's still quite striking, right? The top 20% earning over 62% of income. And the, the other thing that comes through really strongly in the statistics on slavery are uh, clearly that there's more equal income distribution in northern states than in southern states. And, and then if you are to focus in on the southern states where wealth is most unevenly distributed, it's still the case that 30% of families held slaves, but less than 1% owned over 50. So the inequality of ownership through this plantation system was incredibly high. Less than 1% of southern whites owned over 50 slaves. So this was a system that was incredibly hierarchical. The industrial era also had a, a striking concentration of wealth. This 50-year trend that Senator Pettigrew in South Dakota tracked as of 1921, pretty similar to today, even worse though actually, um, that the top 5%, not 10% today, owned 75% of total wealth. And the bottom 66%, not just the 50% today, were practically without property. So Pettigrew at least found even higher economic inequality, but we're, we're on our way to that. Um, and then we, we talked about this as well already. Um, but the income inequality is projected to go even higher in the United States by 2030. And um, then it starts to look even worse than the, slave, uh, the slavery statistic at, on the very top. So uh, I would say we're at least in the ballpark, statistically, of these other eras in history in terms of economic inequality. So that's the first piece of the puzzle in my comparison. The second piece of the puzzle is a little bit more qualitative. Um, clearly, Gillens and Page made it a bit more statistical and empirical, 
but as a general rule, measuring political responsiveness is more of a qualitative endeavor. So uh, for this, I turn to some analyses throughout history. Um, so the antebellum era, one of the questions is what prolonged slavery, right? Why did slavery last and why was slavery so deeply rooted as to provoke a war as opposed to dissolving uh, for other reasons with time? Um, so one person I looked at is Congressman James Ashley who attributed slavery to a government dominated over by the minority, administered by organized force and fraud in the interest of a privileged class. Also Senator and later Vice President Henry Wilson, he developed the same view exposing what he called the slave power. And the slave power, in addition to owning human beings, he felt entailed ownership of government. So he cited a number of plantation owners in government, how southern state governments especially were totally rigid in their support for um, the plantation owners. And then, um, maybe I have a few photos of these guys for you all. Uh, here's James Ashley, the congressman. Here's uh, Senator and later Vice President Henry Wilson. And here's, oh, no, sorry, to the right is Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, who was actually considered one, in a study I read to be one of the most hated men in the, in the Confederacy, which I thought was quite an honor one could have back at the time. And the reason for that was uh, that his opposition to slavery was also Christian in nature. So the, the Christian slave owners felt that this guy was really undermining their claim to be uh, basically civilizing these slaves, who were an uncivilized people in their view, and back at home, quote, were worshipers of the devil, which was one of the greatest quotes I found from this in the literature at the time, that there's this religious justification for slavery where you were doing these people a favor, right, by dragging them forcibly, killing most of them in boats on the way to the United States, and then whipping them, et cetera, et cetera. But this was for their own benefit in the ideology of the time on a Christian level. But Beecher said no, um, and so hence uh, hated. Another person who linked the endurance of plutocracy now more on the Gilded Age side um, was Theodore Roosevelt. His 1912 platform, when he ran as a third party candidate, is really interesting. It discusses a um, behind an ostensible government, uh, Roosevelt cites enthroned an invisible government owing no allegiance and no responsibility to the people. And I mean, this is one of the most famous US presidents. And it's remarkable that he would speak in this terms, uh, in these kinds of terms. He called political parties Instead of instruments to promote the general welfare, he said that political parties had become the tools of corrupt interests, which used them impartially to serve their own selfish purposes. So Roosevelt really um, lays down this kind of line uh, that FDR follows. FDR calls um, the big movers and shakers of the day economic royalists. So this is a bit like um, um, de Tocqueville talking about the old aristocracy. So FDR is talking about economic royalists who would be on the side of the monarchy. And he calls them an economic, um, economic despotism, economic tyranny. And he says government by organized money is just as dangerous as government by organized mob. So these are just qualitative indicators of tying the extreme political inequality of the day to this unequal representation on the basis of wealth. And in the neoliberal era, today's era, there's absolutely no shortage. That's just a cottage industry now. Um, so okay, so that's our second element. Um, so 2014 gave us extreme economic inequality. And so we, I'm saying we can think of that along the lines of slavery and Gilded Age capitalism. Then the 2014 indicators also gave us extreme political inequality. And I'm saying the same trend holds. Highly similar descriptions from these three eras in history. And then the third thing uh, that 2014 gave us was a Supreme Court justification for highly unequal economics and highly unequal politics. So um, once again, the question would be, does this parallel hold? Are there, is there a high degree of similarity on this third point of constitutional legitimation for highly unequal states of um, economic outcomes and political power. So here, um, the, the first place that uh, I looked was Dred Scott v. Sanford, which is that famous case of um, a slave, uh, Dred Scott, whose owner took him into free territory and then took him back to um, a slave state. 
and then Dred Scott sued his owner, saying that by bringing him uh, into, into a free state, he had emancipated him and deserved his freedom. The, court, the Supreme Court decides the narrow question of does Dred Scott have legal standing to sue his owner, but turns the narrow question into a referendum on the, sli on the system of slavery itself. The court ends up deciding the question of whether a Negro, quote, a Negro whose ancestors were imported into this country and sold as slaves could be considered a citizen. So could African Americans be considered a citizen? Um, and Chief Justice Taney, in probably one of the most notorious decisions in, in Supreme Court history, says we think that, uh, that um, they cannot be considered constituent members of the sovereignty. There were, of course, free states at the time of the Constitution being ratified. So this, um, the assumptions in Dred Scott, I think, have been debunked. And people have found, well, that this was probably actually a racist decision, not just a faithful exercise in originalism. Right? Because what they're trying to figure out is at the time the Constitution was ratified, could uh, African Americans be considered members of the constituent sovereignty or not? And the way to look at this narrowly is to say you're just looking at uh, the view of back then. The way to look at it, I think, more realistically is um, without even going into critical legal s studies, just a legal realism frame, I think, would say that there's a fair deal of racism here when the court says, these slaves and their descendants were, quote, beings of an inferior order who might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery, slavery for their benefit. Naturally, such beings were, quote, altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations. So this is a constitutional legitimation of the, of the system of slavery and the plutocracy indirectly that sustained that system. In the industrial era, um, Lochner is the most famous case, 1905. The court invalidates a state law that prevented bakers from working more than 60 hours a week. And this was, in the court's view, uh, an assault on the general right to make a contract in relation to one's business or simply to allocate one's labor uh, and, and, to, and to, to sign whatever contract one wished. The court located this general right to make a contract within the liberty of the individual protected by the 14th Amendment. Um, and then relevant part that reads that, that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. But what the court did, of course, was to substitute this unregulated economic freedom for liberty itself. And um, it's also interesting because, of course, this amendment is passed to protect freed slaves who are looking to uh, well exercise liberty and equality in a different way than the, um, the business owners who want to work people more than 60 hours a week. So um, let's see. There's a number of cases in this line. But I'll just tell you one of them that I think is really poignant called Coppage v. Kansas. And this is a case in which the court weighed in on uh, a key part of the progressive movement. And this was, uh, this was really based in Kansas at the time, where a law made it unlawful for employers to coerce, require, or influence employees to forgo union membership. So the idea behind this state law in Kansas was that it was unlawful for employers to stop uh, their employees from organizing and joining unions. Right? So the, the Kansas Supreme Court said that this condition of freedom, where uh, employers can simply insist on whatever conditions they want in their contracts, that kind of freedom, they said, reduces employees to mere serfdom. That's the word the court used, serfdom. And that the state has the right to protect the freedom and independence of employees. But the Supreme Court took the case reversed, and they recognized as legitimate the inequalities of fortune, like Piketty today, the inequalities of fortune that are necessary results of the exercise of property and contractual rights. The court reasoned that prohibitions on union membership posed no constitutional problem because all men were free to decline the employment on those terms because, quote, it takes two to make a bargain. So this is um, that fictional world where everyone is free and that's just because of course you know power doesn't exist right there's no there's no notion of a hierarchy in play it's just equal beings contracting in an open marketplace and those were the assumptions the court had until 1937 so i would check that as another exercise in constitutional legitimation of extremely high inequality and power balances and then the us supreme court in the neoliberal era i told you um, about um, McC uh, mccutcheon already but there's, um, sorry, this is uh, Dred Scott, there's Chief Justice Taney, uh, here's the bakery in, in Lochner. Um, I mentioned McCutcheon, but there's a long line of cases that is doing much more specifically 
than Dred Scott and the Lochner line. It's much more specifically validating plutocracy itself. And that's the difference in this line of cases. So there's the commonality in all three eras in, of history that the Supreme Court is legitimating the conditions for high inequality and for unequal political influence. But only today, well, from 76 onward, has the court considered the heart of that, the unequal influence itself, to be democratic. Right? Because the, in the slavery case, they're simply talking about an original understanding of African Americans as not part of the sovereignty. In Lochner, they're talking about um, freedom uh, uh, of contract and economic liberty, but they're not validating the undue influence of wealth over politics. They're simply taking on the, really the contractual issues. And, um, but here, in, in because Buckley to McCutcheon, this line of cases goes specifically to campaign finance, party finance, and outside speech. They're weighing in directly on the heart of it all. And that's why this third cycle of American plutocracy is so interesting, because the court is saying, um, well, actually, you know, this isn't just economic liberty, the money being spent. This is political liberty. Money is speech. The court says, okay, so uh, Congress in 1974, when you're uh, enacting those aggregate donation limits and expenditure limits, your goals include making people more equal reducing the speech of the influential so that others can have more influence and that someone without access to concentrated wealth could run for office without having to contend with these incredibly high um, barriers in the form of an $11 million campaign or a $1 billion campaign. So here uh, the court is, uh, what they do in Buckley of course is to say that this notion of political equality is entirely foreign to the First Amendment as though the First Amendment were the only constitutional provision on point and it just keeps going like that. Um, at one point in 1990 in, in Austin, uh, Justice Marshall decides that the undue influence of aggregated wealth is a form of corruption. So this undue influence theory of corruption that the court validates six to three, and you could go the other direction, but then in 2010 in Citizens United, the court in just one sentence says that that notion of undue influence as a form of corruption is contrary to the open marketplace of ideas. Very Loch, very Lochner-esque or Lochnerian. Um, on that front. So um, we have this parallel as well. Um, now, so if we look at those three cycles of American <coughs> democracy with their economic inequality, their political inequality, and their Supreme Court legitimation, they have some things in common. Um, not exactly how long they last, uh, eight years, 42, and now 43 years and going. Um, but one thing that, that I think that, that's interesting that they have in common is the amount of time between the cycles. So from 1865 to 1895, yeah, well, that's 30 years, right? From 1937 to 1976 is a bit more than 30 years, but it's right around there. And if I were a historian, I'd be wanting to calculate national memory. You know, I'd be wanting to ask, how long does it take for people to forget? Because that's what appears to be happening. If you're clear that this is wrong in Dred Scott, then how do we get to Lochner? If we're clear that this is wrong in Lochner, then how do we get to, um, to Buckley and Citizens United and McCutcheon? Uh, and I recognize there's different ways of seeing these cases ideologically, and you can make an argument that this is very different. But in terms of economic inequality through law and policy, in terms of law and policy being captured, and in terms of the Supreme Court saying <coughs> that that's constitutional, there's uh, some pretty serious commonalities. And um, yeah, so this is that more of a cyclical model. Um, the other thing that I think we tend to assume, I don't know if this is true in Australia as well, but that history is linear. You know, that there's more and more progress. There's a general movement towards the completion of democracy. As Xu Chang was saying before, right, that there's this project, it's always moving forward. Well, actually, for 30 year periods, um, it moves backwards. And now for 43 years, it moves backwards in certain key ways. So history looks cyclical, um, 30 to 40 years apart. So uh, ultimately what I'm trying to do is ground, because this chapter is introducing campaign finance reform, I'm trying to ground campaign finance reform in a project, right? in a greater project than just a series of technical reforms to reduce rent seeking. So I'm trying to ground campaign finance reform in, a, in an effort to combat this third cycle of systemic corruption. Uh, and I'm trying to say that you can situate the campaign finance reform movement in the ongoing movements, really since the Declaration of Independence, to end political exclusion. 
in the United States. So um, what, what this looks like, this is just a partial list of uh, the democratic achievements of uh, just even from the 19th century forward. And this is what looks very linear. But what I'm trying to do in, to interject into this article is the sense that, um, well, uh, between Jacksonian democracy, when white men without property finally got the vote, talk about a civil rights movement, right? Freedom for white men, finally. Well, they couldn't vote at first in many states. There's only 50% uh, suffrage for white men without property in the US. So that, once Jacksonian democracy is consolidated, there's this, do I have a laser? There's this huge um, event here, right? And beforehand of the slave plutocracy. So this, this ends up ending here with the Civil War, and it goes down for a while, but no sooner is the Civil War over that we start to get into industrialization and this concentration of capital once again. So things move backwards, even though there's some political pro uh, progress being made. Then with the New Deal and the Great Society, things uh, start working again towards meaningful freedoms for, for all members of society. Uh, but no sooner does that and voting rights kind of come to a place of consolidation, then we enter into another cycle of plutocracy. So if, if you look at it this way, um, what I try to do by the end of the chapter is to put campaign finance reformers in a role that they're not really familiar with, I think, for the most part. Um, there's some civil rights advocates, I've met a few of them in Georgia, who are really on board with the campaign finance reform movement because they see it as the natural extension of the civil rights movement. Uh, Martin Luther King was going to issues of socioeconomic status when he was assassinated. And so for, for a few people, that's a natural role to imagine themselves in. But on the whole, it's not. And the campaign finance reform movement has been highly technical. So I'm trying to situate it actually in this democratic evolution towards political equality and popular sovereignty overall, in hopes that that might be a more accurate historical frame um, because you know, like, what's not clear today? You know, we're, so we're becoming aware of climate change, for instance. And if you read Naomi Klein's work, and if you read Transparency International's work, and um, many other sources, you note that rent seeking and lobbying and money in politics is a major obstacle to uh, action on climate change that would be sufficiently strong, sufficiently comprehensive to actually forestall whatever sort of apocalypse is on the, in the mix. Uh, in 50 years, that might be really clear. And right now, it's not. Apparently, it's not clear enough. Uh, but this frame, I think, is what allows you to kind of grab onto a moment of history and recognize something from the past and um, potentially take some greater inspiration from that. So that was my hope in introducing the volume. Um, and I, was, you know, I just ended up taking readers through some of these other moments, the Doors uh, Rebellion for uh, Suffrage for Men Without Property, uh, obviously, Frederick Douglass, the great inspiration um, for, uh, for African Americans and, and for white abolitionists as well, female suffrage. And uh, I try to say this is a, this is a trajectory. And um, you know, historically, it does add up, because this is the last thing I'll say before questions and comments. But what was happening in the 1970s when everything seemed stalled? You know, voting rights had been consolidated. And then Rawls comes out with his theory of justice, and he says that the Constitution has to take steps to make freedoms meaningful for all Americans, regardless of socioeconomic status. Right? That your political, the worth of your political liberties shouldn't depend on your wealth. This is Rawls in 1971. And then Congress in 1974 agrees with Rawls and enacts ex expenditure limits and contribution limits for reasons of equality and for reasons of opening the political playing field to people without that kind of money who can't otherwise mount a viable campaign. So Rawls gets written right into the Federal Election Campaign Act, and that's when the third plutocratic cycle begins in 1976 with the Supreme Court's decision that those state interests don't pass uh, strict scrutiny. So um, I really do think that's where the nation was building up to and that this long reign of American plutocracy is sort of a great forgetting. It's a great forgetting about where we were, uh, where we were heading. Um, so I'd love to hear your reactions to this, and I'm sorry for not adding much about or anything about Australia, but I am aware that you've had major reforms lately with uh, issues of foreign donations. I'm aware of the, um, the National Integrity Commission that's going forward. Uh, I don't know what state it's in. But um, I'd love to hear whether any of this graphs on to your interests or concerns, and whether you have any questions or comments about the US scenario. Thanks. Thank you.
two minutes for questions, comments, and discussion. Andrew? Uh, Paul? Yeah, I'm really interested in what I Thanks. work on somewhat par parallel areas but coming from free speech rather than capital finance. I like your overview of the US approach. Um, and in the written chapter where you, you, you use things like the associated press case and I'm thinking back to some of them and some of the capital finance cases. I had what might be a silly aside, but it just occurred to me when we were talking about the duration of these periods. One of the differences now to early 20th century or earlier is that on average Supreme Court justices have been a little lot longer. <laughs> so it's one Interesting. It's actually worth noting in some way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. part, of the, part of the possibility for change is also a turnover of the court, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which presumably now is going to be a lot slower. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there has been increased discussion over term limits yeah. along those lines. See. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Paul? Um, just notice with you know, those three cycles of autocracy that each of the first the first two it took a major capitalism to to change things. So there was you know the, the first one was after the Civil War. The second one was the Great Depression and the New Deal, really sort of almost well, quite revolutionary changes. Right. So do you think it would require something equally sort of mm -hmm. huge to change this this third cycle? And could the fact that a lot of the Democrats in America have quite, you know, relatively radical policies, could that be part of it? Yeah. The fact that there's now more radical policies coming out of the Democrats, Democrats yeah. could that be hope that there could be change without well, could a crisis? Could be a sign that, you know, of a, a big break with the past? Yeah. Um, whereas you could say with, with uh, Obama, he basically was more of a centrist, and yeah. Yeah, in this awful situation, I don't want to risk the total collapse of the economy, but got to take the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I like that comparison with Obama because uh, he's such an inspiration for, for progressives and um, for minorities at the time. But if you looked at his campaign financing, he did that 50% from small donors, which was remarkable. But then he did 50% from large donors, and he set new limits, new records. And I was looking at his, um, his ambassadorships and his uh, appointments in the administration, and a lot of those people were campaign bundlers. There, there had been raising large chunks of money for him, uh, and it really made me question the, the commitment, as well as the balance between fundraising and um, basically open rallies, you know, that there were many more fundraising events than open rallies. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I, I've, I see some change in platforms being offered by the Democratic Party, I, but I don't know whether any of those platforms will actually go forward. Um, if they did, then maybe, maybe it's true that we could have meaningful change without another cataclysmic event. Um, I wonder whether climate change is going to be the cataclysmic event this time in terms of pointing at the, the money-driven politics that are resistant to change in the public interest. Because it seems like the climate is the definition, one of the things that would be a definition of what's in the public interest, right? What's a public good? What kind of uh, thing like that could be um, compromised by the private interest, right? There's really no better example, I think. Um, so I don't know. I mean. Uh, is this just human nature, right? And, and, and I, I'm hesitant to say it's just human nature. I think it, um, or maybe it is, but I'm hesitant to say at least that it can't be overcome. You know, that, and that, that's where I think Tocque de Tocqueville's quote is so wise, that if people live with a sense of history, but really a felt sense of what it must have been like, you know, to, to, to fight in the Civil War or to be part of the Underground Railroad and to really live in that sort of way, I think people would be taking really courageous actions now, but I, I don't know. Um, I fear I'm just rambling in response to that question. I don't know what it, what it's going to take. Uh, and I'm actually afraid that Trump might win. Um, oh, and to, you know, to add to this question of a, catacly a cataclysmic event, that could also be authoritarianism beyond climate change. Because the other interesting thing that I see, that all of us see happening, of course, is this illiberal populism that's spreading. And if you look at the literature on that, uh, I really love Ronald Inglehart and Pippa Norris's analysis of how there's economic insecurity, which makes people vulnerable to cultural backlash. And so it's the, you know, the liberal populist um, pitch is to incense people's cultural, racial, uh, national sensibilities. But your vulnerability to that is really grounded, I think, a lot of the time in economic insecurity. Not poverty, but insecurity. Mm -hmm. um, so if that's the case, then the crisis to, to provoke people to do something about plutocracy could actually be authoritarianism. 
like authoritarianism, climate change, it's not looking good. Mm -hmm. uh, Zim, Jenny? Uh, Tim, very, very interesting. Thanks for that. Thank uh, you. And I, I like this sort of locating of um, Cafe Planet to the name and broader history. It's a very, very interesting and insightful um, approach. Um, your talk got me thinking about um, sort of cycles and, and, and history more generally. And the, the, the narratives you tell, uh, I've often heard from Economists, political scientists talking about kind of cycles and economic cycles, oh, yeah. and politics, whatever. Um, and so, what you're doing is really distinctive is, 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 is you throwing the spotlight on the Supreme Court. Um, and what I was wondering was how you see the court and jurisprudence um, in relation to uh, economic trends and sort of political dynamics. I mean, what because at one level the court is, in your story, legitimating, um, it's doing ideological work. Yeah. At another level, you might view it as being um, its decisions as a consequence of that context. And yeah. what, in a sense, I'm interested to know your... Right, I mean, that. The, absolutely. The Supreme Court, or specifically the justices, are a repository of the intellectual trends of the time. Yeah. And I think it's no coincidence that, uh, I think, um, exclusively they've been educated at precisely the elite law schools, not just the University of Chicago. In fact, there are, I'm not sure which justices even went to the University of Chicago, but that the law and economics movement was highly salient in these people's formations. Um, so that is, I, I do think that's a credible explanation that as intellectuals uh, rooted in their moments of history of um, the beginnings of neoliberalism and so on, that yeah, they became repositories for this sort of um, public choice theory as a normative approach because it's very interesting as a, as a descriptive approach, and I think that's where it has real value. In, but as a normative approach, then you're in Ayn Rand territory, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I looked into this for, the, for my first book, and something funny that I found was that Ayn Rand um, and a number of her disciples, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on their names, it's been a while, uh, were highly critical of money in politics because they were true believers in economic freedom and the sort of merit and morality of these great bringers of creativity and intelligence and relentless um, uh, ambition, right, for, for improving products and services. But they hated money in politics because they saw it as uh, crony capitalism. Yeah. Um, but I did, for somehow I think, and that's what's ironic for me is because that they're at, sort of at the extreme mm -hmm. of that you know, public choice theory, law, and economics as a normative approach, but at the same time, they utterly reject mm -hmm. what the justices have affirmed. Yeah. And I found that very straight. And also, um, Gary Becker, I think, at the University of Chicago, Posner, you know, uh, Richard Posner, have been very critical of money and politics and rent seeking. It's almost a, uh, something that conservatives and liberals really agree on yeah. that it's wrong, sometimes for different reasons, but that it's wrong. Yeah. Um, but it's the ideological conservatives, Martin Reddish, John Samples, um, Reddish Samples, who else? Um, basically, and the Ayn Rand Foundation today, who say, you know, actually no money is really speech and uh, price signals are how we want to organize democracy and all mm -hmm. of this stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like Milton Friedman and Hayek on steroids or something, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but yeah, so no, I think they are, you know, from a law and society standpoint, it does make certain sense. And, John, and Marshall, Justice Marshall, in the Austin opinion, of course, is the lawyer from Brown v. Board. So he's highly sensitive to exclusion and inequality and how that might affect uh, people who he knows. <laughs> Whereas a lot of these other justices probably don't live around people who are disadvantaged mm -hmm. by these trends. Mm -hmm. um, so I like, I like where you're going with that, um, but my concern is that the justices are uncritical repositories of intellectual trends, that the leaders of those trends don't even accept this manifestation of them. Uh, and that makes me wonder about whether this is more like tyranny and domination as opposed to a good faith effort to arrive at you know, a just society. <laughs> I don't see it as a good faith effort to arrive at a just society. I really don't. We'll get the uh, last question and comment, Jenny. Um, thank you. Thank you to you. I just really enjoy listening to the talk and I look forward to now going away and reading it happily. My um, sort of um, research interest lies in not-for-profits and not-for-profits as a political activist. Mm. 
implied they were trying to do the not-for-profit into your history as well. Um, particularly because you, you started by saying, well, who is, uh, or asking the question, who is feeding and telling us that mostly it's not-for-profits, whereas those who are following, pursuing causes rather than profits, such as environmentalism, uh, protection, I see. Um, yeah. sustainable need, et cetera, et cetera, um, their voices are not heard or they don't have the same impact in terms of being, um, and even through to neoliberalism, you know, the, the idea that the, sort of the, the rich own government, and now through neoliberalism, government owns not the profits mm. as well through cooptation. So um, I just found it fascinating. But I, so I just wanted to ask you generally, do you have a sense of where the not for profit um, dimension of society into your history or have you sort of seen them in, in the cycle, cycles? Anyway? Yeah, I mean, the, the strange twist, I think, in the story is um, 2012, 2014, when the dark money groups pop up in the United States, so the political nonprofits, but of course they don't have the kinds of causes in mind. Actually, well, some of them do have um, sort of morally conservative causes in mind. It's not all distributive economic issues. But um, yeah, they've been one of the kind of dark horses, you know, in the race where uh, I guess it's 501c4s and 501c6s, I think, under the IRS uh, under the code. Um, but there's rules about how they can only take, uh, I think, you know, at least half of their activities or funding has to be destined for social uh, active, no, what is it? Um, sorry, I'm blanking on the legal standards, but it has to do with sort of giving back to the community and being involved with the issues they say they're involved in as opposed to just lobbying the government. Um, but they've been a, a really strong force behind um, modern day campaigns since about 2012. And they, their money is quite hard to trace on purpose. Um, and their money appears to be quite unrepresentative as well, of course. But in terms of um, grassroots groups and what the kinds of causes you have in mind are actually more the, the ordinary citizen public interest kind of cause? Well, this is the question, is where, what role the money, because, I mean, if, if these people were not pursuing for-profit greed or power, um, but they, you know, what if the same amount of money was being spent on, mm. I guess, what you consider to be the just? Yeah. My second question was really then about well, you're talking here or suggesting some kind of trajectory. What is your trajectory? What is your motivation? Because when you describe the political um, authoritarianism, I, I see authoritarianism as a climate change as being the catalyst. Um, I mean, I've been following the Indonesian elections recently, and that's just that's it's just very open. And you could, I mean, the comparisons now between other jurisdictions, you don't have that Western slash first world traje trajectory. Live and understand the same dynamics differently. So when I was talking to an Indonesian about the, the election and how they view buying votes and what happens after an election and how the favours are then paid out. I mean, it was absolutely fascinating, but it was all quite openly accepted. And, and, and I was wondering, is that because they've simply transplanted democracy without a history? I mean, what role does our, I mean, well, what does it say about um, your trajectory as a, as a incident of faith Yeah, <laughs> makes me feel better, but it's very interesting. I hope my rambling was half as interesting as that. <laughs> um, I mean, about could more money solve the problem if you equalize the funds available to some of the nonprofits um, or cap the others? I mean, the, the, the key would be the incentive structure and the capabilities of campaigns, right? So 
incentives for election and re-election, can you get there by catering to those interests? So if you could get there economically to mount your viable campaign by catering to those interests, um, they'd have to take care of you on the outside spending front too, not just the campaign donation front, but the, the various groups and super PACs and so on that are propped up to defend or attack. Uh, so you'd need that, but if you had that, then yeah. And um, you know, I think Obama's some proof of that. Um, and even Bernie Sanders' primary campaign was fascinating that he, he raised almost enough money from 20, on average $27 donors. Um, so I mean, I think there, there are definitely possibilities for equalization, but I don't know, and I guess you'd, you'd need pretty strict expenditure limits to equalize wealth across for-profit corporate multinationals and your local non-for-profit, right? And right now that's politically impossible with our Supreme Court. Um, and I'm not sure which direction Australia has taken that way with expenditure limits. Um, I mean, yeah, and in terms of culture, I think that's absolutely right. I think that, that all these events, the slide I had in, in, on democratic history, had to do with, with belief in democracy and even stronger than belief, love for democracy. And when I, I've only started to delve into the democracy as social movement frame, but the, the kind of um, heading I'm working with is love for democracy. And this chapter I'm writing on uh, for a constitutional amendment is that these things occur when people are, are committed. And that's what the civil rights movement was about, right? Was that heartfelt uh, commitment. So um, yeah, that's, that's my read on it. But uh, I don't know how that graphs onto the present. Uh, I don't think it looks very good in the present. <laughs> yes, well, that that's note. why we're losing. <laughs> Can you please join me in thanking Tim Bengali? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.